I'm Graham Huon, and I'm currently the chair of the AES Melbourne section. And tonight we've got Dr. Martin Koshoko, who's going to give us a talk, and that'll be on the impact of remote music collaboration software, especially during this uh, time we've spent for the last 12 or 15 months and other topics too. Uh, I'd like to thank Fabio, where's Fabio? for uh, uh, helping organise this too. So thank you to, to him as well. Uh, tonight, we've got a few housekeepings. One of them is, uh, if you can, activate your mutes if you're not talking, that would help. Uh, and if you have any questions that you want to get lodged, Martin has said he'd like to take those questions in the flow of the session. So if you can do that, and if that gets out of control, we might have to go through the chat process, which should be at the bottom of your screen. If you can enable your pictures, we love to see people. It's really good. Um, what else did I want to cover? Now, tonight I've got uh, quite a bit of information about Dr. Martin. Uh, and I'll go through that. Uh, but first off, let's talk a bit about what tonight's session is. At the end, I'll make any announcements that we need for general administration. Collaborative software programs enable interaction between global communities of recording artists and music producers have grown exponentially in the last decade and have undergone further changes during the current COVID-19 pandemic. Reflecting on this, on his creative work, as well as practice-led doctoral research in his area, Martin will discuss remote music collaboration software and the impacts on contemporary music production practices. Martin will discuss these technologies in the context of teaching music production, as well as collaborating on industry-based projects within various genre of music. He will also examine the behavior of groups of remotely located music makers and analyze user engagement in crown source music production projects. Now there's a fair bit in that. So I'll be looking forward to hearing about it. A bit about Dr. Martin Koshoko, and uh, I hope you approve of that pronunciation. Oh, yes, perfect. I've got a small smile. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Dr. Martin is a recognized expert in remote music collaboration. He has presented at national and international seminars and conferences and has published in the area of the art of collaborative music production and mobile music innovation. He is the founder of the musiccollaboration.online portal, providing workshops and coaching on remote music collaboration strategies. Martin is a music producer known for his creative work under the Koshoko, and that's correctly pronounced. Another correct pronunciation. And Ayuba project monikers. He has extensive experience as a composer, music and video producer and performing musician and is vice president of Clan Analog Recordings, the record label arm of Australia's longest running electronic music collective. He has produced and contributed to over 30 releases on a number of labels, including Disco Texas, Emerald and Doreen, and Clan Analog. His music performances utilize mobile and interactive technologies and have been seen by international audiences. Martin's academic research explores various aspects of computer sound production, including remote music collaboration, mobile music making, and interactivity in electronic music performance. His practice-led PhD project investigated the impact of remote music collaboration software on music production and involved collaborations with over 40 musicians located in various geographical locations on three continents, Europe, North America and Australia. And so this is not just theory, this is practice. He has been teaching sound production and other music industry related disciplines at Melbourne Polytechnic and the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University in Australia for over a decade. I'd certainly like you all to welcome Martin and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. So there's a little bit of welcome or you can press the button and applaud. Thank you very much. And, and that's great because you've all got your mute buttons working. I'd like to hand over now to Martin and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Martin. 
thank you very much for this uh, generous introduction, Graham. It's very, uh, uh, very touching. And uh, when I just uh, look at uh, who is logged in to this session here, um, I can see a few names uh, of people who I have met uh, at various international conferences. Uh, uh, so I'm really uh, impressed that people from uh, overseas also are joining us today. And of course, it's great to meet people uh, who I have met locally, either as students or collaborators, um, plus a lot of people who I have never met before. So thank you for attending uh, this session. Um, as Graham has said, uh, from the point of view of uh, the flow of our uh, session today, uh, I think it's uh, always great if we could uh, jump on questions as we go, rather than wait until the end of the session. So if you have any questions, feel free to, I guess, raise your um, virtual hand through the reactions on Zoom. And if I will not notice your hand, that could be because you might be on the second screen. I can only see one of two screens of participants, just because I'm sharing my screen between Zoom and uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, so if anyone could uh, bring it to my attention that there is a question, uh, if I haven't noticed that question, that would be amazing uh, and much appreciated. Um, so as Graham has mentioned in his introduction, uh, the basis for my uh, knowledge on the topic of remote music collaboration is a PhD project uh, which I commenced uh, in 2012. And for the last nine years, I've been really closely and participating and following the developments in the area of uh, remote music collaboration. So. I guess we could say before it was uh, forced upon us uh, the way it has happened last year due to COVID-19. Um, so uh, going back in time to the start of my exploration uh, in 2012, uh, I, I just started uncovering a lot of uh, online tools for musical expression. And very quickly, I realized that there was um, a huge variety of, of uh, available uh, online cloud-based tools, ranging from uh, virtual instruments, which you could play uh, within, for example, a standard web browser, to more sophisticated um, collaborative solutions that eventually took form of very powerful digital audio workstations. Um, so my first uh, step was to have a big look and overview at what was available and then try to narrow down my uh, focus to uh, selected platforms. So what I uh, decided to do for the PhD project was to use very three very different collaborative uh, solutions. One was uh, a web browser based digital audio workstation called Audio Tool, which is uh, a modular uh, system uh, based uh, primarily on MIDI. Um, MIDI uh, music making, uh, but also there are some options for including audio recordings. Uh, and then I looked at another product, which was a fully fledged digital audio workstation with very advanced collaborative and communication settings. And that was uh, OM Studio, OHM Studio. And the third type of product that I looked at was um, more like a um, collaboration management system, which uh, is available in the form of platforms like such as Blend or Splice. So those 
platforms allow to utilize existing non-collaborative uh, digital audio workstations such as Pro Tools, A Ableton Live, Logic Pro, and so on. So I used Blend uh, as well for conducting collaborations with uh, established uh, digital audio workstations as well. So that was the start of the journey, which has resulted in a, a project, PhD project, which uh, ended up involving uh, over 40 musicians from three different continents and over a dozen um, original music compositions created in that process. Um, so that project uh, uh, has been completed uh, in around 2016 or 17. Um, and after that, uh, I continue uh, to use uh, digital audio workstations that allow uh, me to collaborate with people around the world. Um, and it's interesting to reflect back on what has changed uh, since 2012. So uh, a lot of new products are continuously coming to the market. It's quite interesting how, how we see a huge, um, uh, I guess, flux of new products that come and go in that area, which somehow creates uh, less stability and less certainty about what will last and what will fail. And I will talk about what has, uh, what has happened last year because, because we have seen some interesting uh, announcements about platforms being closed down and platforms that were on the brink of extinction coming back to life, presumably thanks to uh, increased interest that um, has been uh, you know, happening due to COVID-19. So, uh, so there is a lot of uh, change in, in remote music collaboration software uh, constantly. And that's, uh, that's one observation that um, can be made just reflecting back on the last say eight or nine years in that area. Um, so I might just start sharing a few slides um, which will allow me to uh, show some visuals. Um, so I hope you can see this um, PowerPoint slide. You might see my head going sideways sometimes because uh, I've got another screen next to me. Um, so this is the topic of our conversation. On the bottom, you can see a link to my uh, platform where I'm going to be uh, expanding a few resources about uh, music collaboration online. And I just wanted to start with um, dividing remote uh, music collaboration or online music collaboration into three different uh, categories. Uh, the first one, which is what I have started researching during my PhD uh, project uh, time, was virtual studio-based collaboration. So very much focused on uh, joint songwriting, recording and mixing. Uh, and that's one type of approach which necessitates slightly different focus from collaborators and also uh, determines our technical demands or uh, what kind of uh, internet connection we have to have in order to execute that kind of collaboration or what kind of latency would be acceptable for that type of collaboration. So platforms that I have mentioned already like Audio Tool, Blend or Ohm Studio, they were set up to enable virtual studio collaboration where you are recording with your collaborators and creating 
uh, original music or covers, uh, if you wish to work on covers, but you creating a project like you would in a studio situation. Um, and I would, uh, I would probably talk primarily about that type of uh, work today, but not exclusively. One reason for my ma main focus, I guess, is because I know that uh, Fabio, who is uh, here with us today, um, has uh, Fabio Marassini has covered uh, live jamming uh, over the internet quite extensively uh, a few months ago. Uh, that was also a presentation for the Melbourne chapter of Audio Engineering Society. So I don't want to uh, cover the same ground as Fabio because he's, he has done such a fantastic job already, but live jamming over the network presents um, different objectives for the collaborating parties. So there has to be a dis dis distinction drawn because uh, often when I use the term remote music collaboration, uh, I would get uh, people assuming that it's one or the other, either live jamming or studio-based collaboration. So I think it is important to be specific and uh, outline what type of work a specific software will allow us to achieve. Um, of course, live jamming will have uh, a lot more focus on issues such as the latency, because it's critical that we have to hear ourselves and our collaborators really well. Um, last year, during the lockdown in Melbourne, um, I have started uh, performing uh, live online, uh, and that those performances were done uh, publicly. So uh, that was with the collective called Clan Analog, and we have done uh, a few uh, live performances over Twitch. So we were broadcasting to Twitch, but for, for the audio side of, uh, of things, including the mix and uh, the, the monitoring of every participating musician, we, were, uh, we have settled on using the Jamulus platform, which I know Fabio has referred to a few months ago as well. So, um, we have launched one album, for example, in October last year during the Fringe Festival in Melbourne, which was uh, for the first time delivered exclusively online. And uh, in May, a few, few months earlier, we have done a similar performance where we had musicians performing publicly uh, and they were located in Melbourne, Sydney and Canada, I think Vancouver, if I'm not mistaken. So our collaboration was done through the Jamulus platform um, and streamed to Twitch live. Uh, and we even were selling tickets to that performance through the Fringe Festival uh, in Melbourne. So um, I'm bringing this up because um, last year was a great opportunity for me, as well as I'm sure many people here who, um, who might uh, for the first time have had experiences with um, jamming in real time over the network. Um, and the third, the third type of uh, approach that I would like to uh, put in the spotlight is um, more marketplace and social networking oriented collaboration where we use dedicated software that allows us to find collaborators, uh, but that software does not allow us to um, record anything or mix anything. It presents a necessity for using third-party tools uh, offline. Uh, so, so the marketplace networking uh, approach uh, is probably something I will not discuss in too much detail today, 
primarily because uh, it's, it's being executed through websites that allow musicians or music producers or sound engineers to uh, create their profiles online and sell their services to potential clients. And clients could also use those platforms to find a suitable collaborators. Um, so just before we go any further, um, what I would love to ask everyone who participates in this session is um, to uh, like indicate what type of experience uh, you might have had to date with remote music collaborations. So I'll try to enlarge my screen and see as many people as I can. So could I ask people who have had experience like uh, hands-on experience with virtual studio-based collaboration. Could you put your hand up on the screen or use the reaction, like the emoji for, for the hand rising? I just would love to see, so I can see two hands. Is there more or just two people have had the virtual studio experience? Did I miss anyone? Okay, so maybe only two or three people. Okay, so not as many as I expected. That's very interesting. Um, and now the same question about the second type of collaboration. So the live jamming over the network. Has anyone who participates today had that experience of using any software to do uh, live jamming with other people? Again. I see two hands raised. So no one else. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, and the third type of uh, approach, marketplace and networking. Has anyone advertised their services or sourced any collaborators through any platforms that allow for uh matchmaking uh people uh, and creating collabor collab collaborative situations has anyone so aaron i can see fabio anyone else dennis okay so all right that's interesting that sounds like most people who are participating in that session are not haven't used uh collaborative software before so um that's very important for me to know. It will help me to know how to approach this uh, talk. So thanks for letting me know. Um, okay, so moving on, I might go back to screen sharing again. Okay, so we are back to the slides. And before we go into the present. Dennis, uh, I can see your hand is uh, uh, showing up on the screen. Did you have a question? Or is that emoji staying from the previous? Okay. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them as we go. Um, but maybe, maybe that was an old emoji. So, um, I just wanted to very quickly uh, highlight that despite perhaps some assumptions, um, uh, online or re remote music collaboration is not a new, not a new approach. So um, it dates back to the late 1970s. So I just wanted to highlight some of the past developments to put this discussion into a bit of a broader historical context. Um, so as you can see, I have outlined a few key projects on this slide, uh, and they can give us an idea of what has been happening already in the past. Uh, when we think about the origin of networked music collaboration, we can, uh, highlight a group of musicians called the League of Automatic Music Composers, 
um, who uh, were operating in the San Francisco Bay Area between 1978 and 1983. Um, and members of that group connected uh, together via network during live performances. Um, and the image you can see on this slide showcases some of the equipment that they have used during their um, networked performances. Um, so that group uh, has morphed into another group called The Hub, or at least some members from the League of Automatic Music Composers became members of The Hub which uh, operated until 1987, sorry, 1997, actually. Um, and uh, I guess the breakthrough performance that they have delivered was linking two separate venues in New York where they were exchanging data using early modems and a phone line. Um, and of course, the data bandwidth was very limited back then by today's standards, um, but that performance was considered a big success and has launched a uh, decade-long decade uh, career for the hub. Interestingly enough, they, uh, they started international um, performances uh, and they were struggling with uh, software and network technology. So uh, after a particularly problematic performance uh, in 1997, uh, they have admitted that the technology had begun to defeat, defeat the music um, and they have uh, stopped uh, networked music collaboration shortly after that performance. So what we see from the kind of from the 1990s uh, is uh, rapid advancements in internet technology, um, and initially a lot of the activity was embracing email and uh, Usenet email discussion groups, um, and through those groups a lot of uh, jamming on the web started to take place. Um, so, for example, uh, in the early 1990s, uh, there was a platform called NetJam, where users started to experiment with real-time music collaboration, where they have been exchanging MIDI files via dedicated servers that allowed them to synchronize data and organize virtual jam sessions over the network. Um, so that kind of music experience was quite compromised due to uh, very limited bandwidth at the time. Um, however, that situation has changed with the arrival of the Rocket Network in uh, around 1994. Um, I would guess that probably some people who are with us tonight or today, depending on which time zone, you, time zone you are in, probably have heard about the rocket network. Has anyone actually ever used the rocket network in the 1990s by any chance? Are there any hands up? Just browsing through the feed, but I don't see any hands up. Um, so, it was quite groundbreaking because it was a lot more user-friendly than a few of the predecessors that I have mentioned. Um, uh, and it had a, uh, a graphical user interface with which we are quite uh, familiar nowadays. Um, so made it a lot more easy to use. Um, and the platform has started its life as the RES Rocket website. And there were two British musicians responsible for that initial um, development. Uh, they were members of two bands, uh, Dread Zone and London Beat. Uh, London Beat, you might recognize because it was quite commercially successful at the time. Um, and they uh, worked with two software developers um, and created this platform. 
uh, which became very successful. And by the late 90s, by 1999, it had 15,000 users. Um, and that was at the time when personal computers uh, became um, fairly affordable. And of course, operating systems like Windows and Mac OS X became fairly um, audio friendly and uh, initial developments uh, in the digital audio workstations started rapidly accelerating at that time as well. Um, so actually Microsoft Corporation was one of the early financial backers of, uh, of the Rocket Network as well. Um, and Rock the, the Rocket Network has su successfully uh, established partnerships with companies like Steinberg uh, or eMagic and also DigiDesign. So two of those are still major players in the digital audio workstation market. Steinberg, of course, develops Cubase. Um, well, DigiDesign, of course, has been, has passed on Pro Tools to Avid eventually, but um, an eMagic was acquired by Apple and uh, initially was responsible for the creation of the Logic uh, digital audio workstation. Um, but it just shows us how successful the Rocket Network was and how strong those industry um, relationships were at the time. Um, but despite all of that, um, as the platform has been growing, uh, it couldn't sustain the growth. and it couldn't uh, probably satisfy some of the desires of their uh, uh, investors to bring enough income. So the, the platform started to struggle um, financially in the late 90s. Um, and um, it has been actually acquired by Avid Technology um, uh, and I think that happened in the early 2000s. And ironically, shortly after that acquisition, Avid has shut down uh, the rocket network. Um, and as you might know, not that long ago, Avid has reintroduced um, real-time music collaboration into Pro Tools. So that's quite interesting that they acquired that technology um, almost almost two decades ago now, and um, for a very long time, uh, didn't put it to any use. Um, so um, just wanted to bring up this uh, very powerful, uh, powerful uh, platform because it has been groundbreaking and in many ways resembling the contemporary platforms as well. So what you see on this screenshot is just uh, uh brochure uh promoting uh rocket network and talking about uh topics that are completely relevant to uh our discussion in 2021 which is quite interesting when we think this was happening in the late 1990s um and here is a screenshot from uh, the user manual uh, of Rocket Network. Um, and again, that kind of approach to exchanging uh, MIDI and audio files is still relevant today. Um, uh, you might also have noticed that I had a couple of other um, names listed on that screen. Uh, Bitnik and WebDrum. So um, Bitnik was a platform developed by another successful musician slash music entrepreneur, uh, Thomas Dolby Robertson. You might remember Thomas Dolby from the 1980s. He was a pretty popular electronic music slash pop uh, producer and performer. Um, so so Bitnik uh, incorporated general MIDI, uh, software synthesizer, and uh, 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 a MIDI editor uh, and audio editor that allowed to use custom audio samples. Um, 
and it was optimized for the web browsers uh, that were popular at the time. For example, the Netscape Navigator web browser. Um, and it became uh, uh, listed on the stock market and apparently sold for uh, over $60 million uh, at the time uh, in around uh, the late 1990s. Um, and the last example here is Web Drum, which was an online uh, drum machine, uh, again, optimized for Netscape Navigator, which was, I think, probably one of the most popular browsers before Microsoft uh, has dominated the scene with Internet Explorer um, in the 90s. Um, so it was again, allowing multiple collaborators to um, exchange musical ideas uh, online through the web browser and um, implemented some uh, real-time communication such as a chat room. Um, so I just wanted to bring this up quickly to demonstrate that the forward thinking approach uh, in that area uh, you know, precedes the modern times and uh, many of the companies that develop collabor collaboration software for musicians nowadays stand on the shoulders of those early developments. Um, so going to the present, uh, as you can see, there is a lot of um, different types of uh, collaborative solutions that I have listed on this slide. And um, the present uh, landscape of remote music collaboration software is uh, fairly complex and it spans entry level uh, products as well as uh, fairly complex, uh, well featured fully fledged digital audio workstation platforms. Uh, some of them created from the ground up with remote music collaboration in mind. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are also product management, uh, uh, project management systems that allow us to turn otherwise non-collaborative uh, DOS into virtual collaboration environments. Um, and what I would like to also highlight that uh, the software that uh, allows collaboration includes desktop, desktop applications, web browser based systems, as well as iOS and Android uh, apps. Um, and apart from apart from mm, small developers that operate in that space, in the last few years, we have seen established uh, software uh, manufacturers such as Avid, Steinberg, and Propeller Heads uh, also entering uh, this field of uh, remote music collaboration. Um, so one very critical but often overlooked aspect of, of remote music collaboration software is um, what I have explored quite uh, deeply during my uh, PhD research, and that was the aspect of crowdsourcing uh, and finding new collaborators online, new musicians, new music producers, uh, whom I would otherwise never be been able to uh, collaborate uh, with face-to-face. -face. Um, and many of those platforms that um, I have used uh, boast very large numbers of users. I will bring up some tables and uh, a rubric showing a few, few stats later on, but for example, the biggest number I have heard to date, and perhaps again outlining the impact of COVID-19 on that area, is that 
a digital a collaborative digital audio workstation called bandlab has reached uh, 30 million registered users in march this year so that's obviously a staggering number uh, of people who already are creatively engaged in that area and just using one platform of course many music makers would stick with one platform but not use another so if we add up um, the numbers they look really uh, large so that's something else um, worth keeping in mind about the interest from users and music practitioners that um, those platforms have already generated. Um, so what drives the developments in that area uh, is, I guess, what uh, in the 2000s has been labeled the Web 2.0, which um, reflects the internet, uh, which uh, allows for uh, social networking, uh, connectivity with mobile devices, and increasing storage space for, for data. Uh, all of that has been utilized quite uh, well by contemporary collaborative solutions. Um, and the social networking aspect is a fairly critical feature built into many uh, RMCS um, or remote music collaboration software platforms, which allows us to tap into those networks of collaborators. Um, and I think what I uh, realized that many music makers or music producers um, overlook that social networking and the creative crowdsourcing aspect. Uh, and that means that it would, they would only try to collaborate with someone they already know. So for example, you might have a partnership or a friend somewhere around the world with whom you would like to collaborate and you might establish some kind of process with them. Uh, but I found it really fascinating when I was uh, networking with strangers and making music with strangers. And in fact, from the 40 plus collaborators with whom I worked uh, towards my PhD project, only one person was known to me prior to uh, the collaboration. Everyone else was uh, someone that I have met online and established that creative uh, uh, relationship with them. Um, so let's let's look at those categories and let's try to unpack them a little bit. So standalone and plugin based digital audio workstations. Um, that's a very interesting um, category because there was only one standalone dough on the market. Uh, called um, Ohm Studio. And Ohm Studio was um, unprecedented in many ways, in a way that it had very advanced audio recording and audio editing and processing features, but also very well developed communication features for the collaborators. So speaking of the communication, you can see a few levels of the chat room, public and private and project specific uh, chat rooms, and also um, ability to advertise your projects as public to anyone logged in at the time. Very easy, it was very easy with own studio to see who is online at the time, the screenshot I'm showing you now, you can see how many people are actually available at the given time. Um, and uh, this screenshot shows you another layer of Ohm Studio, which is the uh, editing layer and mixing layer where you uh, could access 
third party plugins because that application was standalone, meaning it has been installed on your computer. So all VST plugins available to you were also available in own studio. Um, and what is quite sad is that despite of the changing landscape last year during COVID-19, Home Studio um, has have announced that they are closing down. And in September last year, they made an announcement that the platform will disappear within the next few months, um, which was really sad because there was no other solution on the market like Home Studio uh, in terms of managing multiple uh, collaborators in real time, uh, how it allowed to record into a fairly sophisticated um, mixing environment. But Graham, I can see your hand is uh, raised. Uh, yes, Lila Flane has asked a question. I don't know whether you can see it there. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, okay, uh, well, uh, just to use the example I'm currently looking at, uh, it was definitely a multi-tracking experience. So, for example, in Ohm Studio, I uh, could I was collaborating with a drummer who would record uh, eight or ten channels uh, of his drum kit being mic'd up and recorded live into Ohm Studio. Um, so it is. It is multi-tracking if the user uh, wished to do so. And other platforms uh, allow for multi-tracking as well. Uh, essentially, whatever audio interface you might have available to you, uh, you could enable in quite, quite a few collaborative platforms. So if your audio interface allows multi-tracking, then there are no major technical problems with that approach. But thanks for that question. That was that was um, definitely um, an important uh, technical issue to cover. Um, uh, speaking of plugins which imitate digital audio workstations, not long ago, uh, only a few months ago, a new player has emerged on the market called Satellite Plugins which is an interesting product because it's like a mini uh, digital audio workstation that runs like a plugin within your other possibly non-collaborative non digital audio workstation. So uh, for example, I have been using satellite plugins in Ableton Live, but it uh, doesn't discriminate between those so I could collaborate with someone who is using Pro Tools, for example, and exchange MIDI and audio files between the those. So it's like a great um, um, middle ground that brings together audio and MIDI irrespective of what software the collaborators are using at the separate ends. Um, so those two examples that I was just showing, I would put them into the first category. Um, the content management systems uh, is something I already have mentioned. Uh, platforms like Blend or Splice. Splice is particularly popular because um, it uh, monetizes its products through subscription model uh, that allows users to access uh, sample libraries and also plugins, uh, plugins that could be rented for a short term or uh, purchased uh, permanently. So Splice and Blend allow uh, Dropbox-like cloud-based storage uh, for um, for sessions that could be uh, conducted uh, with the use of 
otherwise non-collaborative DOS, for example, you could take Logic Pro and Ableton Live and collaborate uh, with someone else uh, with the use of Blend or Splice. Uh, and the software will not only back up your project uh, data for free in the cloud, but also manage um, changes. So notify collaborators when, uh, say, a new track has been recorded or notify collaborators when um, a new update has been published by someone and also keep the track of changes and keep the track of who has contributed what to the collaboration. Um, the third category I have on the screen is browser-based uh, digital audio workstations. So we have products like audio tool, for example. So you can see a screenshot here of audio tool, which is a very interesting um, software from the design point of view, because uh, it connects modules with the use of virtual cables. So if you teach signal flow, for example, um, it's a great, um, great platform to explain um, analog signal flow or even digital signal flow, but it's also quite beautiful to look at. And um, it imitates that approach, uh, the analog um, hardware approach where everything has an input or an output and has to be connected to a physical mixer or virtual mixer input. Um, that screenshot shows the cables, but I'm not sure if they are very visible because they quite faint. Uh, so, uh, of course, this is just a screenshot, but if I would be currently using that platform, I could zoom in and see really closely all the inputs and outputs, as well as the cables. Um, and the platform allows us to add modules. And of course, because it's all virtual, we could use as many modules as the system allows us to process, but theoretically, it is unlimited. And the modules consist of um, uh, synthesizers, drum machines, samplers, but also uh, effects that look like guitar effect pedals. I'm not sure if you can see those little, little boxes here, but uh, they are like stomp boxes, uh, which, you know, they could represent delay, reverb, distortion, and so on. Um, and the mixer also has a limited amount of uh, channels, uh, let's say 16. So if you want more than 16 channels, you have to uh, daisy chain multiple mixers, uh, just like you would in the analog world. Um, and what's interesting about audio tool is that it runs purely in the web browser. So it doesn't require installation of any software. So you just log in to your user profile and you have access to your, um, uh, your projects that you have created. Um, other examples of more traditionally looking web browser-based workstations would be um, BandLab, SoundTrap, and Soundation. So those are three other platforms. I don't have the screenshots here, but um, the interesting thing about, for example, SoundTrap and BandLab is that they run um, on the desktop as well as uh, in mobile app form so they can be accessed uh, on mobile devices um, as well as computers um, and that brings us to that other category which somehow is intertwined with the browser-based those which is mobile apps so um, the mobile app market is quite interesting because we have companies like BandLab or, or SoundTrap, which interestingly enough is owned by Spotify. 
Um, I'll get back to Graham's question in a moment. I can see it on the chat room, but um, uh, I'm just uh, highlighting that some of those companies operate in both um, desktop and mobile environments, but there are some uh, products that only run as an I iOS app, for example, and uh, a product I could uh, highlight here is Audio Bridge. So Audio Bridge is uh, an iOS only um, application for uh, remote music collaboration. So in terms of this uh, question we got on the chat room from Graham about how are stomp boxes implemented? Um, let me find this screenshot. So uh, in audio tool, this is all a drag and drop. You have a sidebar on the side showing you available devices. You just drop them into your project and, and then connect them with the virtual cables to uh, whatever you would like to process. So for example, if you want to use return effects on your mixer, you would connect the stomp box as a, as a return effect using the send and return um, connections on the mixer. But you could also connect it directly to, say, the output of your synthesizer. So you could have your synthesizer going through a distortion uh, unit stomp box, and then that would be uh, the signal from the synthesizer going into the input of the stomp box, and then from the output you would go into the mixer where you would process that signal further. Um, so they are really intuitive in that way that it is um, the closest analogy I could make is propeller head reason software. So I'm sure many people are familiar with that software because it also has like the front of the interface and the back side on which you can see the virtual cables and you have the flexibility with how you connect those cables as you would on a analog hardware uh, devices as well. So Graham, does it answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, another another uh, example of a present solution for remote music collaboration are audio streaming plugins. So um, there are plugins such as Audio Movers that I think has grown quite substantially during the COVID lockdown because even in the teaching situation, many teachers uh, resorted to using Audio Movers plugins. Um, a new platform uh, that has been launched only late last year is um, uh, Sonobus, which I think Fabio has covered as well. Um, and those are fairly, um, fairly simple solutions because they you put them on your established um, uh, DO uh, channel, could be your master output, for example, or it could be a specific track you want to share with your collaborator and you stream the audio in high quality to whoever you want to collaborate with. Um, so uh, they are very similar solutions, uh, audio movers and Sonobus. Uh, however, Sonobus is, um, is uh, currently free, um, whereas audio movers is uh, more of a commercially um, based platform with um, either weekly, monthly, or annual membership pricing models. Um, and the next category is established established DOS. So that's an interesting one because um, we have 
big name developers like Steinberg, for example, which uh, has uh, developed uh, its own plugin for remote music collaboration and um, uh, made it uh, available to its users. Um, Propellerhead uh, developers of Reason also um, had a platform for remote music collaboration built into their iOS apps. Uh, that platform was called Ali Hoopa. And again, it's an example of an unsuccessful venture from a big developer because Ali Hoopa was shut down um, a couple of years ago. But initially, it allowed for um, cloud based data storage and uh, and uh, offline uh, collaboration with, um, with anyone who was a member of that platform. And then of course, we also have uh, Avid, uh, which uh, a company that makes uh, Pro Tools dough. And a couple of years ago, as I've mentioned already, Avid has launched um, remote music collaboration to its users. Um, again, this comes at an additional cost where users have to pay uh, more for uh, cloud-based storage. So many Avid users who I spoke with um, found it as an obstacle, financial obstacle, and the uptake on Avid's Pro Tools-based remote music collaboration it doesn't seem like it's as big as perhaps the company has hoped for, but it has been in place for a couple of years now. Um, and then we have um, music networking platforms. Uh, uh, for example, Sunday is uh, one of them where you can operate on a desktop machine or uh, uh, download an app and uh, uh, collaborate, but with the use of third party products. So platforms like this do not provide you with any um, music making tools. And I know Spotify also has a, a platform where you can hire a mastering engineer, or you could hire a mixing engineer, and you could even calculate, calculate the quote online for their services depending on the level of expertise that you would like to uh, get on, on board. So, um, so that's another type of collaborative solution, the marketplace plat platforms. Um, and I've got here a master rubric, which I think you can't really see any, anything on that screen. So what I will do, this was just really a placeholder for me to remember to bring it up in a PDF form as a separate window. So what I will do, I will share that. I will share that with you like this. Um, this one is. Um, let me just make it a bit bigger. Is that easy to read? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, this is just something I've been developing uh, for a few platforms, but what I'm showing you now is just um, kind of like a comparison between Audio Tool Blend and Ohm Studio. So uh, you can see, uh, for example, whether a platform is synchronous or asynchronous, meaning whether the collaboration happens in real time between collaborating parties or whether the collaborators have to add their contribution at a separate time. So both Audio Tool and Ohm Studio were uh, allowing for both modes of work. You could do it in real time with your collaborator or you could do it when your collaborator is asleep if you're working with someone from a different time zone. Um, you could also see whether a platform allows you for importing 
uh, of MIDI files or exporting various formats. As you can see, there's quite a comprehensive list of formats available, uh, ranging from lossy to lossless formats. In the case of Blend, this is purely third-party software dependent because Blend is just managing other software such as uh, Pro Tools, Ableton Live, Logic, and so on. Um, and what I also listed here is the data I have received from uh, the makers of those programs about their numbers of users. So with Audio Tool, um, they told me about 650,000 users. Home Studio was uh, quoting 80,000 users and 150 projects. And um, a topic that often comes up in relation to music uh, collaboration online is the protection of copyright and licensing. So you could, you could see what each of the platforms had to say about licensing and copyright. As you can see, some of them support both um, copyrighted material as well as licensing your work as a Creative Commons license. Um, or perhaps they completely seize uh, that decision to the users and allow the users to negotiate uh, the type of uh, license among themselves. You can also see how statistical data is tracked by selected platforms, what kind of information you can get as a, as a producer creating a piece of work. So you can trace plays, likes, comments. You can see how many remixes or versions of your work ha have been created. You can track the samples that have been used, uh, their origin, you can track presets um, or even devices used um, in some, uh, in some uh, respects, depending on the platform. Um, and you can also share your work with the social media uh, as well. So I don't know whether there are any questions about this rubric or whether I can move on. Perhaps I will move on. I will stop the share. Um, uh, Martin, I think um, there's a, I think it's more of a comment from Ben Loveridge mm -hmm. in the in the chat. You might like to comment on his comment. Yeah, uh, Soundtrap is pretty easy to use. Definitely, yeah. Um, yep, uh, I agree. They definitely invest quite uh, heavily into the user interface development. So I think it's interesting because Soundtrap, Soundation, and BandLab, they really competing uh, with very similar products. And um, it's interesting to see how different the, the pricing models are. Because, for example, BandLab is offering everything for free, including algorithmic mastering. Uh, as you know, this is another uh, interesting topic in itself, but many platforms like Lender charge quite hefty fees for that, whereas um, uh, BandLab offers that service for free to anyone. Um, but yeah, Soundtrap uh, is a subscription-based model. So if you want to get all the features, you have to be uh, paying a monthly or an annual subscription. Um, and Sonobus is a very interesting one because uh, it's an open source platform. So it's just getting a constant uh, stream of updates. I was just looking at the Sonobus forum today and there was a new update uh, released on the 15th of April, uh, which I haven't updated my software yet, but 
they just constantly are launching new features and uh, again they offer all the functionality for free um, and Sonobus is also interesting a bit like audio movers because it's being used by both live jamming uh, musicians as well as uh, music producers who would like to um, collaborating, collaborate on the mixing or songwriting uh, process as well. Uh, so they kind of manage to find traction with um, both groups of remote music collaborators, virtual studio and live jamming um, groups. And um, I might bring up the slides again. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight the importance of communication in uh, executing a successful collaborative project. Um, hands down, this is the most critical uh, aspect uh, of uh, collaborative Martin, software. There was just a question following on from that last discussion from Lilith. Mm -hmm. And she asks, uh, with the free platforms, are users agreeing to some kind of use of transferred files or data analysis permission in exchange for use? Uh, uh, let me just read that in more detail. So some kind of use of transferred files or data analysis permission. Um, I don't I think, think- I think the question is there is some, are you compromising some rights um, through uh, the use of free platforms? I would say I haven't yet come across a platform that tries to claim any ownership of your audio uh, data or audio or music creation in broader terms uh, to the point where they allow you to release music often, uh, well, uh, through their platform even. Uh, and uh, I think BandLab is trialing a um, music album uh, release through their platform. And you can also use third party payment system, um, not PayPal, but I think it's Stripe. Is it Stripe? I think that's another uh, payment solution. And I don't, don't think they take any uh, ownership at all. Um, I, I would imagine that with the data analysis, some data such as, uh, for example, how many plays your project will receive or comments on your work, that data is public to anyone uh, because it's online. So even if you know a third party uh, would look at your uh, public data, they would see the same thing that you are seeing. So, but that's probably not the data anyone would be necessarily very concerned about sharing. Um, so I wonder if there if there is any data that you might have specifically thought about, Ben. Oh, sorry, that was Lilith. Um, yes, so definitely the, check the terms because you know it's uh, the devil could be in the details, and we all know that uh, frequently we might need to sign uh, terms and conditions. But I would imagine that the data that would be available there is not um, as easy to commercialize as it is with our data on social networking platforms like Facebook, for example, which would uh, have a lot of uh, a lot broader data about your activities. Uh, I, I'm not aware of uh, any of those collaborative platforms doing what Facebook uh, is also doing, which is tracing your non-Facebook activities, for example, uh, meaning that if you browse eBay at the same time as when your Facebook is 
open, Facebook will know that you have browsed a product on eBay and you will receive an ad about that product on Facebook. So I don't believe that kind of data mining takes place on remote music collaboration platforms. Um, that would be my response to that question. Well, I, I would guess that the, the important question then is what are these free services business models? How are they going to make money? It's a very good question. And uh, I have mentioned that uh, I am in the process of launching a podcast for my platform, Music Collaboration Online. And my plan for that podcast is to interview uh, uh, manufacturers of those platforms and ask them about monetization. Uh, it's interesting enough uh, to look at some of those companies. I already mentioned that some of them are, are affiliated with very um, big industry players. So for example, Soundtrap is owned by Spotify, for example, and their product is not free. Their product is subscription-based. Um, on the other hand, when we see uh, platforms like BandLab, they offer everything for free, but also they, when you look at the history of the company, they have received some, um, some funding from financial backers in the past, and they also acquired other products uh, in the music industry, for example, music magazines. I think the Rolling Stone, uh, for example, is owned by the same group. And um, I think it's a critical question because I can see that some, some products, and BandLab is a good example, you can, you can tell that there is a lot of uh, developments happening on a regular basis. Updates are coming frequently. They publish updates on their blog um, and they develop simultaneously desktop and mobile applications. Um, and on the other hand, I can see that some other platforms like uh, Ohm Studio, which recently ha uh, has announced the closure, despite of um, having free and commercial options available to users, they were not able to financially sustain their um, business model. Um, and looking back at that space, you know, many unsuccessful ventures, I definitely think that the business model is uh, at the core of what succeeds and what fails. Um, and it's very, very fascinating uh, to, to actually uh, try to analyze the business model from the user point of view without looking at anyone's um, uh, you know, tax returns or financial income statements. But when Ohm Studio, and that's a very interesting uh, piece of information, when Ohm Studio has announced the closure in September last year, uh, and they are still running, by the way, the platform is still available, but the closure is uh, imminent. But what I was going to say is that when they announced the closure, they said that they never made a profit since day one, that they were operating at a loss. So that was a big public announcement about their lack of financial success in that area. And you can see it on their blog, um, so it's public. Um, but that was also very interesting to see how difficult it was for a company having the best possible product, how difficult it was for them to monetize it. Of course, you know, we can ask questions whether their management and marketing strategies were up to scratch. Perhaps questions could be raised, raised about the effectiveness of their marketing. Um, but uh, it is very sad to see that a great product failed in selling itself to the public. Because what we are left with right now, there's no similar alternative product on the market to what Ohm Studio represented. Um, there's a 
few questions. Um, Few questions. Let me check those questions in the chat room. Um, uh, Lilith is saying that uh, type of computer learning makes virtual mastering convincing. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, if it's free, there's, I guess, quite easy to experiment with the quality of that mastering. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think. Uh, you know, virtual mastering could be also done by human beings if you hire a mastering engineer through one of those platforms. Um, okay, so um, I might I might uh, keep on moving. So this slide is highlighting some of the available um, uh, communication tools, which are really critical to sustaining the collaboration. Um, and Fabio is posting a comment that they are pre-revenue, which again, I guess, you know, if it's a new company that maybe has been operating for a, couple, a year or, or, or something like that, that's quite reasonable. Uh, but of course, you know, if you have a company that's uh, operating for six or seven years, then something is not quite right. Uh, so Fabio, a uh, question or a comment? Yeah, no, just a quick comment. In, uh, I'm just, I don't want to name any names, but just a few that I interviewed for my podcast. They hadn't been going for as long as you said, but it was also clear that during the interview, they didn't really want to say specifically that they already had a monetization uh, process in mind because, because, because they were not 100% sure of what it was. They were still trying to find out where this particular service was going to take them. Yes, and it's interesting to see that there are some groundbreaking ideas in that area and satellite plugins is an example of that and Ohm Studio is an example of that. But then you have a lot of well, maybe not a lot, but several products that I already have mentioned that seem somehow similar to one another. So what I'm saying is that there are people putting a lot of resources and money into some collaborative solutions that would have a lot of competition already on the market. And then um, questions could be raised about their marketing plans. How are they going to commercialize that product? Um, but uh, yes, Fabio, uh, oh, actually, I think that's, sorry, that's Ben who mentioned about uh, acquisition, mentioned, mentioned something about acquisitions. And that's, that's also true that there are some big acquisitions taking place in that sphere. And Spotify acquiring um, Soundtrap is a good example of that. Because as we know, Spotify now wants to go more into podcasting and Soundtrap for them is a platform where podcasters could execute the entire recording, mixing and production process with that platform. So with that kind of injection of capital, you could see that the platform probably can take more risks. Um, So that's a very interesting topic, the sustainability of those platforms, how, how they can make it work in a long term. Um, and that's definitely something I'm very curious about as well. Um, uh, I think Fabio mentioned that during your interviews, um, I, th uh, I think uh, somehow I saw a, was it a comment from someone uh, that many many of those companies are not very um, upfront about their business model, that they are not uh, happy to disclose those informations? And I understand that that could be a sensitive topic. So we might never find out exactly where they fail and where they succeed because it, it could be a confidential information. Um, uh, so going back to user engagement, um, 
so I got a question from uh, Graham about user engagement. Um, and the slide I have uh, up right now is important because in my experience, effective communication with your collaborators is the absolute key to sustaining and user engagement, but also successfully finalizing your collaborative project. When I look at uh, failed collaboration, and sometimes when I uh, work with my students who struggle with the collaborative process, typically the struggle is related to uh, ineffective communication between collaborators. That's why it's such a critical part of the puzzle. So it's easy to be very focused on um, purely audio related uh, features like sampling rates, latency and so on and formats in which we could export our projects. Um, but all of that is only as good as uh, you know, the communication between the collaborators and what can they do to make the project work for all involved parties. And um, having communication tools is one thing, but another thing is understanding how to use them. And even more importantly, how to engage your collaborators. So a big part of my process was finding strangers online and engaging them and asking them to collaborate with me or me joining existing uh, projects and contributing to some projects. And um, it's very funny about uh, how people treat online world because sometimes people think it can be a lot more hands-off than face-to-face -face, uh, work with, with uh, collaborators. And, that's absolutely incorrect. It's at least the same hands-on, if not more, probably more, because it takes a lot more effort to sustain uh, remote collaborators who you never met face-to-face, -face, who have very little commitment to you uh, and might have promised you things that they are failing to deliver. Um, so not being aware of that, is a recipe for disaster, basically, and a recipe for um, unsuccessful collaboration or lack of it. So that's why I highlight those existing collaborative tools because they are our uh, ways of sustaining that communication. Um, and moving on to user engagement uh, challenges or project management challenges, Let's talk about a few of those um, issues that I have encountered. So, so, for example, the stylistic bias of users is one of them, um, meaning you might have very different ideas about the creative outcome of your projects. Uh, perhaps you found a great drummer, but your drummer is uh, coming from blues background and you are trying to record a pop music piece with them. Um, so you have that mismatch of the stylistic um, desire to go in a specific direction. Um, if you are using a platform uh, that is lacking some communication tools, then you might also encounter that it's difficult to manage the project and engage the users. Um, a big, big issue uh, that I have come across is lack of technical proficiency among some users. So what that means is that you might have a very skilled musician who wants to collaborate with you, but they struggle with setting up their microphones, st struggle with um, the signal flow. And I have become a coach in some situations where I had to spend significant amount of time coaching my collaborators how to use a given uh, software because they were just not 
tec technically um, uh, savvy. So that lack of tech uh, proficiency might be uh, a challenge and often is. Um, of course, you know, when you work on remote projects, you are affected by all kind of IT issues that are affecting all music productions. So viruses, hardware failures, like maybe your USB uh, audio interface is failing you while you, you are collaborating. You might have crashes of software in the, in the middle of an important session. And of course, internet connection failures as well. So all of that is a challenge. And then on another issue is complexity of managing projects with uh, multiple users and in different time zones. So as you can imagine, the more collaborators a given project has, the more challenging it is for you to manage their input. You might have a drummer, a vocalist, and a bass player. And um, perhaps the drummer and the bass player have recorded their parts, but the vocalist only has done one verse and hasn't done the second verse for two weeks. And you want to wrap up that project. Uh, so you have to reach out to them and establish some kind of system of influencing them to finish that project with you. Um, different time zones uh, can be challenging as well, as you can imagine. Um, although a lot of the programs allow for asynchronous collaboration, so uh, sometimes it's quite magical to work on a project with someone, go to sleep, you wake up, they are in the different time zone and they have created a beautiful part for you that you can work on while they are asleep. Um, I had some amazing uh, experiences with collaborators, sometimes not even knowing that much about them. I remember working on a project with someone from the US. I was um, in uh, Melbourne and I remember I was telling them, we spent probably five or six hours in a session. And I think it was one, maybe one or 2 a.m. here in Melbourne. And um, I was telling them, look, I have to go to sleep because it's getting late here. And they just told me, look, it's uh, 6 a.m. here where I am. And I just spent the entire night working on the project with you. And they haven't complained. Uh, so another, not a challenge, but a fascinating uh, result of many of those collaborative encounters is that you meet extremely talented and generous collaborators online um, who expand your uh, creative network in a significant way. Um, I've mentioned some unreliable collaborators already and copyright violations. I have conducted some surveys with many people using remote music collaboration software. And I have to say it's very, very rare to have any major copyright violations issues. However, it does happen occasionally that sometimes you, you have to, of course, uh, be mindful of that as a potential challenge, but um, uh, sometimes people might be doing the incorrect thing and you have to watch out for that happening. But judging from my own experience and people who I have interviewed, it's a very, very insignificant uh, percentage of, uh, of issues that have been reported. Um, probably one of my last slides. I think we're running late, aren't we? So we probably have to hurry up. Um, so I will um, just bring up a couple of uh, extra, a few extra things about um, user engagement and virtual group work on music projects in general. So um, what makes a successful project? Um, a mix of varied technical and musical skills is very helpful. So having people in a project that can cover several bases is very useful. Um, 
I mentioned building the relationships through the communication tools. That's very critical as well. Um, it's very interesting to observe how people behave online, that some of them want to remain anonymous. You will never know their names. You might uh, ask them questions where they are from, and then you will find out that they are maybe you know, in South America, but it might not be necessarily immediately obvious to you where your collaborators are based. Um, another interesting discovery is that you will typically get more expressions of interest than actual contributions. So typically the ratio is um, maybe three to one on average that you will get three promises of contributions for one actual contribution from musical collaborators in the cloud. Um, a few other things that I've mentioned uh, in passing about the communication tools. This is about engaging the community of users with which you collaborating and also your own profile building. So promoting yourself, talking about what you could contribute to other people's projects and engaging them sometimes on a very social level. Like if there is a chat room, perhaps you could talk about issues that are not even directly related to your project that you want to collaborate on. So that's uh, from the point of view of crowdsourcing, when you want to find new collaborators and engage them successfully. Um, with many of the platforms that I've mentioned today, uh, they operate on the social networking, blog-like uh, list of entries, meaning that new projects typically will get more attention than old ones because you see them in the chronological order. So newer projects will attract more collaborators than old ones. And uh, the last remark on this slide is that remote mu music collaboration software groups tend to be small. And I think the biggest collaboration I was in probably had maybe five people, um, but typically it's just two, two people collaborating on a musical project. So that's the most common situation. Um, so I hope this one talks uh, a little bit to the user engagement uh, issue. Um, now let me check if I can. Uh, somehow I can't change my slides anymore. Why is that? Um, I will skip a few of them. Okay, I was going to play some examples of my collaborative projects, but I think I will skip that just knowing that we are the session is getting longer, so I don't want to uh, run over time, but um, those collaborations, uh, like the project called The Giver, um, you can easily find them online uh, on Spotify or Bandcamp. So that was released under the name Koshoko. And you can just see uh, the breakdown of roles uh, in a project like this. So you can see that there was five collaborators, um, user number one, that's myself. And then you had um, one person in the USA, another in Italy, someone in Poland, and another person in the USA, but from an undisclosed city. Um, so this is just a, to give you an insight into the breakdown of roles in a project. Uh, so that project, for example, was executed in Ohm Studio. Um, another example of a, quite a different project where I was looking for um, uh, remix collaborations. So that was executed through the Blend platform. Um, and there were three contributors, uh, one from Belgrave in Australia, but I have never met them face to face, even though we were in the same city. 
um, there was someone from London and someone from Croatia. Um, and again, we engaged through Blend and mostly used Ableton Live software, but I think in one situation, someone was using Pro Tools as well. Um, okay, so that brings us to what has changed in 2020. So I have went through a couple of those, a few of those uh, points already. So there was a demise of Ohm Studio, which was happening despite of what you would expect to be the peak in their interest. Um, but there were platforms that have grown during the pandemic. So we had Jem Kazem, who was a collaborative solution from the US. And you could see that they were slowly shutting down their operations prior to COVID. I looked uh, at their Facebook page and their website at the start of COVID, and you could see that the po posts were like very outdated. But then they got um, they got uh, uh, an injection of interest during COVID and started updating their platform again. Uh, Graham, do we just have five minutes left? Oh, roughly yes. Okay, so I will, yeah, I will speed up the delivery. So yeah, um, Jem Kazem, Jamulus, and Audio Movers have grown in a significant way during the pandemic, and they are all platforms that support live jamming. Um, we also uh, could see a huge influx of users uh, using the Band Lab. Though, so as I said earlier, they reported 30 million users in March. Um, and very interestingly enough, the emergence of new platforms such as Sonobus. I, I haven't mentioned all of them today, but another one is PayJam, Rehearsal Live Share, and Satellite Plugins. So those are the new players on the market. I have a, a screenshot here from the Rehearsal Live Share platform. Um, and I think this is the end of my slideshow and the end of the end of the talk. So I'm sorry if I run over time. <laughs> That's okay, Martin. Uh, excellent. Are there any questions, any more questions from the field? No, but you're allowed to unmute and talk. I hope I'm unmuted. Good. Okay. I might, I might stop okay. the slides, but yeah. Um, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a question. Still... Rodney um, Staples has a question. I am not surprised. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this online jamming obviously has sort of taken a large prominence during the um, COVID lockdowns and. I presume that's going to go for another year. But what sort of impact is that having on live music performance and, and live performing musicians monetizing their skill and experience? Did you say monetizing? Yes. Um, well, look, I, uh, I've mentioned briefly um, that those solutions, for example, Jamulus uh, have allowed me to play a commercial event in Melbourne uh, in, uh, I think, November last year, meaning that we sold tickets through a Fringe Festival to an event where participants played live through Jamulus platform. And then uh, we broadcasted uh, the audio as well as video part, because everyone was also filming themselves at the same time. We broadcasted this event uh, live uh, on Twitch. So monetization is actually quite uh, quite possible. And I know, Fabio, uh, I was listening to your podcast the other day and you were interviewing someone from, was it Sonobus or another platform where they specifically set up themselves to actually allow musicians to sell tickets to um, online uh, performances 
Uh, no, I have not interviewed um, um, Sonobus, but I think I was talking with somebody about Jam Kazem. How... There's, a, there's another, another could, There could podcast. be another one, but Jam, Jam Kazem, as you said, I had the same experience where when I found out about it in March 2020, their videos on YouTube were all five years old, and then all of a sudden they started updating. And then they now have a model where if you pay for the top package, you can do online busking directly through them. So instead of stitching Jamalus and OBS and all that stuff that I talked about back in November, that is probably what similar to what you did as well. You can just, you know, if you're not a tech savvy person, just go to their platform, play, pay the price and hook up directly with like a Twitch stream that you can charge for and things like that. But I will be, I will not be surprised if there's not others trying to do the same thing. My question is only, and I don't want to steer the pot here, is like, how long is it, is it going to last? I think you might be referring to the fact that when I interviewed B-Chain uh, two weeks ago, their CMO, uh, it's a company from England, he's uh, skeptical about this ever continuing beyond COVID because he thinks that, especially in the UK, the UK when it, whenever we go to the new normal, people are just going to pack the concerts and forget the whole live streaming thing. But that was his view, really. Uh, although I think Rodney's question reflects multiple needs that people might have when it comes to using this software. So one need could be to play commercially uh, available, high level, interesting gigs to, uh, to the public. But on the other hand, you might also have a need for, j for bands to just jam privately without any public uh, visibility just for the sake of developing new material. Uh, you might have the need of songwriters to privately developing new songs and recording them uh, without any kind of uh, broadcast of the public, uh, of the collaboration to the public. So I think uh, those are the interesting aspects uh, of the collabor collaborative software that it could be used in so many different ways from so many different uh, perspectives and reflect quite a lot of different needs, performance, production, songwriting, uh, concerts, live, uh, live rehearsals, but in private. Uh, so I think the monetization for musicians is only important if they do it to the public, but there is a lot of behind the scenes work that, that software enables. And I think that would be less dependent on the kind of COVID online fatigue because um, yes, I think I would agree that it would be amazing to have live venues reopen and attend live events in person. I don't know if I would enjoy watching events on, on the internet just as much, but I think as a cre music creator, I don't see my need to collaborate with people in Europe or the States or um, Asia uh, decreasing just because COVID will go away. I think I will continue working that way because I can't be with those people face to face. Any more questions? Well, I'd really like to thank you, Martin, for this evening. A lot of things there, but one of them that I took away was the importance, and it's obvious, the importance of the communication tools and the two-way communication channels. And that will be with us forever, but the ones that don't realise this in their packages are probably not going to have a happy time Anyway, on behalf of the Melbourne AES section and on behalf of the larger audio and AES community, I'd like to thank you very much, Martin, for an excellent presentation. And I'd like everybody who's there to join me with their applause symbols or whatever. Thank you very much, Martin. Well done. Thank you very much, everyone. That was uh, great to uh, discuss all of those issues with you. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope it was uh, of value. And uh, if anyone would like to stay in touch, uh, you can find me on musiccollaboration.online. Feel free to sign up for a newsletter uh, when the podcast is available or some free workshops, I will be able to update you on that development as well. 
an offer too good to refuse. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>